we're with Red Wing Kesar. She's a nurse, she's a practitioner of palliative care, she's an author. Am I getting all the notes right or shall I start over? That's pretty good. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> John. <laughs> <laughs> so palliative care, I don't think a lot of people understand the nuanced definition of that versus, say, into life care. So what exactly. is palliative care? Very few people understand what the difference is between palliative care and end of life care. I will admit that I didn't until I watched your series on YouTube. <laughs> so. I'm so glad. So palliative care is really about holistic care of anyone with a serious illness, a chronic illness, including people who are at the end of life. Okay. But palliative care, when it's offered at the end of life is typically called hospice. Right. So in the last six months of life, hospice is your palliative care team. Because palliative care is both a philosophy of care and a modality of care. And the philosophy is the philosophy that underlies hospice, that in order to take care of someone who's at the end of life, you have to not only treat their medical conditions, their physical suffering, but their emotional, spiritual, psychological suffering as well. And that's what you mean by holistic. It Absolutely. is the complete person. That's right. In the entirety of their experience, not the 90s version of holistic, which was crazy right. dancing and, and right. crystals. Okay, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> means all, all the parts of us. <laughs> right. Palliative care, on the other hand, um, is a modality in itself that can and should be employed very early on and can be from the day of diagnosis of a serious illness all the way through the end of life. Well, let me ask you, when you say serious illness, are we talking about a terminal illness? Because as I understand palliative, just the word itself, it's defined as, as just treating the symptoms and alleviating the pain, not trying to cure what ails the person. Well, it's a little tricky. I okay. mean, palliative is about relieving suffering. It's about and again, relieving suffering on all those different levels. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the olden, olden days, the word palliate meant to cover or to cloak. Okay. And then as time went on, it started to mean to make things better. And so really, what palliative care is now is about making things better when someone has, you know, we call a serious illness, I mean, people who are diagnosed with cancer have a serious illness. Mm -hmm. So at the day of diagnosis, they can access palliative care to help improve their quality of life as well as their symptom management. Now often people like myself who go through cancer treatment get better and go into remission and don't need palliative care anymore. Right. So it can be used on and off. Um, like I said, the biggest difference is that hospice is really for the six months of, last six months of life. Right. Hospice is very much in our culture defined by the Medicare benefit of hospice. But palliative care is much, much broader than that. And there are studies, you know, many studies, one very famous one done by a Dr. Jennifer Temmel in Boston mm -hmm. back in 2012 that showed that when people who had lung cancer got palliative care at the same time as their treatment, that not only did they have better quality of life, they actually lived longer. And that's partly because palliative care is provided by a team. It's right. a team sport by definition. Okay. So it's interdisciplinary. There's doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, and certainly in the program that I run, it also includes volunteers. Great. So there are a lot of different people looking at the aspects of suffering and challenge that someone's going through to help you navigate that. Well, I think it's really great that you're, you made that distinction very clear and I, and I have a better appreciation of it now. But um, what I, I did want to ask you about, and uh, uh, feel free to decline if you want, is your own cancer experience and the fact that you too have received palliative care as you indicated. Yes, I have. Are you available to talk about that? Absolutely. So, you know, when a, when a clinician gets a diagnosis, it's sort of a double shock. You right. know, because I have watched hundreds of people under my care go through that very typical shock we talk about when you're at a doctor's office and the person across the table from you is saying, I'm sorry, but you have this diagnosis. And right. 
So yeah, I got that the other day. They said I was 40. I was like, what? It's like, <laughs> that, that's terminal. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> is, <laughs> apparently. Especially since I'm 44. <laughs> uh -oh. yeah. So it was a shock when I got the call saying, yes, as a matter of fact, your scan is positive. And um, I was diagnosed with a stage two ovarian cancer, wow. which for anyone who knows about ovarian cancer, it's actually a very early stage to catch it. So I was lucky. Mm -hmm. I was also lucky that I've been in this field for a long time and I had a whole group of colleagues and friends who work at UCSF in the outpatient palliative care department in the cancer center at UCSF, which is an amazing palliative care team, um, who you know took off their hats of being my friends and colleagues and became my palliative care team. And to have a place to go when one is going through treatment where you can be your full self, where you can cry, where you can freak out, where you can really talk about how horrible this disease feels and, and get, get support on many, many levels. Yes, there's the symptom management and support that honestly palliative care teams are often better at managing pain and symptoms than your primary care doctor or your oncologist because that's really their focus right. and their expertise. But they also provide a level of emotional and psychological understanding that makes you feel like you're not crazy when you're going through the roller coaster ride of having a serious illness. And so I would imagine having gone through that experience that has changed how you approach your work in palliative care. I mean, that's, it's glib, <laughs> but, but did it? You know, I don't know that it's... Or does cancer just suck? <laughs> There's that. <laughs> right, right, okay. There's that. Cancer sucks. Um, we're on the air, so I guess <laughs> yes, we're allowed totally to say fine, that. Yeah. But um, I don't know that it's changed how I practice as much as the relationship that I have with patients, clients, whatever we call them, depending on what aspect <laughs> right. I'm working in. Um, because when I'm able to reveal to someone who's also going through a challenging time in their illness that I've had some of that experience myself, it's a very different kind of conversation that happens because people suddenly open up and trust you in a way that didn't always happen before. You have street cred now. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. I have street cred. It's like, yeah, I know what that IV feels like in my <laughs> arm. I know what it feels like for four and five days after that treatment. And I know why, you know, why people do and don't come back for more. Right, um, uh, the, the next clip question then would be, would you trade the experience? Would you prefer not to have had the experience? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, of course I would prefer not to have had the experience. Right. <laughs> I'd love to have the wisdom without having the experience. But that's that would have how been wisdom great. works. <laughs> that is unfortunately how yeah. wisdom works. Yeah, I get it, I get it. All right, we're with Red Wing uh, Kesar uh, talking about palliative care. We'll be right back in a second. And we're back with Red Wing Kesar. We're talking about palliative care, but before we dive back into it, your name, <laughs> Kesar. Where does that come from? <laughs> yeah, it's probably not <laughs> Kesar that you're really asking about. No. Kesar is an old Russian name that got changed several times. Um, but people ask me about the name Red Wing yeah. pretty frequently. Um, Minnesota, Native American, where are we going? Um, so when I was 19, which was quite a long time ago, um, I had a dream that I was climbing a mountain, and when I got to the top, I turned into a red-winged blackbird and flew off. Wow. And it was a time in my life that I was kind of wanting a different name, and I woke up in the morning and said, that's it, that's my name. Yeah, the 60s now, were awesome. That's right, the 60s <laughs> and the 70s, and I have to admit, I had studied with Native American teachers by yeah. that point in my life. Uh, red-winged blackbirds were a bird that I was loved, and 
the name has stuck, and I never had a middle name, so yeah. officially it kind of became the middle name. And I have to say, even at the end of their lives, my parents even got used to calling me Red Wing, which was amazing. It's beautiful. I, I can relate. Uh, no one begins life as Daedalus Howell, trust me. So, yeah. So, I, there I, you I, go. I, and uh, my parents have, I did the exact same switcheroo as you. Uh, different. All right. My dream was different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, well, talking about your parents, where did you grow up? I actually grew up on the East Coast in New Jersey. Yeah. Yeah, uh, with a Russian Jewish immigrant father and an Irish Catholic mother. It, yeah. was, it was quite growing up. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> and you went to school out there? and I went to school on the East Coast. I went to Brown University. Yeah. And, and then I ended up in California and decided to become an artist instead of a doctor back in those early 70s. And well, how do you go I'm from the East Coast and Brown all the way across to... West uh, Coast and artists. Yeah. Yeah, well, it was those dreams, you know. <laughs> they carried me through a lot of my life. And, uh, but, you know, as happens to many of us who try to be starving artists for a while, the starving part doesn't work for very long. Yeah. And so uh, eventually I realized I was probably going to need a day job that, that could support me. But, you know, I had kind of been a pre-med student, dropped out of that. Um, really wasn't so fond of Western medicine, even though my mm. father was a doctor, my mother was a nurse, my <laughs> grandmother was a nurse. Um, it was in the genes, in my nurse, blood. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, it really wasn't until I had this experience that I talk about in my book that um, when I was 35 and my best friend was 30, she was killed in a motorcycle accident. Oh dear. Okay. But she spent three weeks in a coma at Marin General Hospital and during those three weeks, I was pretty much at her bedside in the intensive care unit every day. You know, she was hooked up to every machine known to Western medicine. And I literally kept feeling like I was being told that the work I was supposed to do in my life was to be a midwife to the dying. And I hadn't even heard that term at that point. That That's was in 1988. Because it really felt clear to me that just as when spirits come into this world, they need midwives, there needs to be someone to help escort that being in, that when people are dying, the spirit also needs someone holding the space there, not only for the person who is dying, but for their loved ones, because we live in a death phobic culture and most people don't have the, the positive experience of being at the bedsides of people who are dying. And a lot of people just don't know how to handle it, whether it's in a hospital or, or anywhere else. So I feel like I was given this amazing gift in my friend's death process to understand that the work I was really supposed to do on this earth was about being a midwife to the dying, about bearing witness to that incredible transformation that each and every one of us is really going to go through. Which is beautiful. And having a calling and having it so particular as, as yours is, is, is amazing in and of itself. And then to do the work that you do and, and to benefit the people that you have is also amazing. But do people ever criticize you or, or suggest to you that you might be, it's almost morbid? You know, I don't hear that comment. I definitely have people say, how can you do this? Right. You know, isn't it depressing? How can you work with people who are dying so much? And, you know, I think most people who work in hospice and palliative care get those comments from, from people, from friends, from family members, like, oh, you know, isn't it a depressing field? And the truth is, when you're called to do something, mm -hmm. It's what you are most passionate about. And when people do get to experience, as I said, a positive, um, a positive experience of someone dying, it's a gift. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a way of understanding what it means to be human, what it means that we really all are impermanent beings. And to show up, and be present and bear witness to that process is, I think, the greatest gift that, that we are given as, you know, clinicians who do this work. Given your first-hand experience witnessing the ephemerality of life, has it changed how you approach your life? I hope so. You know, between doing this work for 
25, 30 years, and then having my own cancer diagnosis. I mean, that's when that reality of mortality really hit home. Mm -hmm. It's like, I talk about it a lot. I teach courses about it. But when someone looks at me and says, well, you have the cancer diagnosis now, it's like, oh, okay, this might be the ticket that is going to be my way out, <laughs> right, right. but who knows, you know, we, any, anything can happen. But I do think that working with people who are seriously ill, whether they're at the end of life or in, in a process of, of dealing with illness, it does make one step back and hopefully appreciate each moment, each day, each breath in a different way right. because you get it that life is short and if we don't do what's really important to us if we don't do the things we're passionate about then what what are we here for i've read somewhere that um, at the end of life a lot of people um, lament not what they did do but what they didn't do do you feel like you've addressed that po that potential regret are you doing or have you done what you've sought to do? You know, I do feel like I've done a lot of what I, you know, maybe didn't seek to do, but was, was put here to do. I feel, I feel pretty complete, and I appreciate feeling that. I mean, I'm 63 years old. I'm imagining I'm going to be here another 20 years. At least, yeah. At least. Yeah, yeah. But if my life is shorter than that, I feel like, I've done a lot of things that are important to me, and I know that I've touched a lot of people, and a lot of people have touched me in very important ways. So I don't think I have regrets. When you are working with somebody who might, how, how do you help them address that? It's always a hard, it's always a hard situation. You know, when someone is clearly at the end of their life, it's often one of the reasons for their suffering is because they feel like things are unfinished or they feel like things are unsaid. I see it much more with younger people who have a terminal diagnosis. I mean, it's much harder for 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 year olds to say, I'm done, I've had a great life, I'm ready to let go and move on now. You know. I've seen many 80 and 90 year olds say, I'm done, I've had a great life, I'm ready to go, it's okay. But you know, quite honestly, I'm working with a woman right now who's 56 and she was only diagnosed with a terminal illness uh, less than two months ago. And I don't think I've ever seen someone surrender to that kind of diagnosis as gracefully as she has. And she's someone who's done a lot of, you know, important work in her life. She has helped a lot of people. And I think she really feels like, even though she's 56, she's done what she was here to do. And that's a beautiful thing. It is. Let's come back to this uh, after a break. We're with Red Wing Kazar. Uh, she works with palliative care, in palliative care, here in Sonoma County. We'll be right back. We're back with Red Wing Kazar. She's the director of palliative care at uh, JFC's Senior at Home Program. What is JFCS? <laughs> Jewish Family and Children's Services okay. of the West Bay Area. So. We actually serve everywhere from Sonoma County down through Marin County, our main offices in San Francisco, and then we also serve San Mateo and Palo Alto. So how does the process begin? I get a diagnosis, or let's not use me as an example, <laughs> somebody gets a diagnosis, <laughs> and then what? So, well, the truth is when someone gets a serious diagnosis and needs palliative care, there, there are often many steps that you approach it with at the same time. Okay. So 
our palliative care team, unlike most palliative care teams, is not in the medical model. It's Jewish Family and Children's Services is a huge social service agency that provides lots and lots of different kinds of programs, right. not only to seniors, but to parents and teens and everything. Um, so people typically want a medical palliative care team, which is there is a palliative care and outpatient palliative care clinic at Memorial Hospital here in Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. All of the hospices, of course, also do some palliative care. But, you know, palliative care is sometimes defined as the extra, extra added layers of care that people need when they have a serious illness. So as a social service agency, what we often provide are those extra added layers. So when someone's sick, they often need what's called a private duty home care attendant. I see. Okay. They need somebody who's gonna come to their house for four hours a day or maybe 24 seven if they're really sick and help with errands, help with personal care if they need it, help just tidy the house, do some errands. So personal care is typically provided by a home care agency and Seniors at Home is the home care agency of Jewish Family and Children's Services. Right, and that's here we yes. have this. Well, yeah. The, yeah. yeah. This yeah, is actually our brochure. And you basically just call our main number, which actually the number I know in my head is the San Francisco <laughs> number, 415-449-3700. Um, but you call us and you let us know what's going on and what kind of services you need. So we have counseling, we have care management, we do have, have home, home care, as I said. Mm -hmm. So we go through an assessment process, we come out and meet you and see what you need. Anyone who's a client of our agency, no matter what door they come through, has access to our palliative care team at no cost. And our team can really help people navigate the healthcare system, be an advocate for you, make sure you're getting the kinds of pain and symptom management that you need, talk to your doctor if that's helpful, mm -hmm. um, pr make sure that you have home care if you need it. We also have an amazing community of volunteers who we train in palliative care. We're actually doing a training here in Sonoma County for the first time this summer at the end of August and beginning of September. Um, and our palliative care team is also interdisciplinary. As the nurse, I'm the director, but we have a volunteer physician who will come and just talk to people. We have a chaplain, we have a social worker, and again, volunteers. So calling us, no matter what question you have, will um, you know, lead you to the services that you need. That's great. A question I've got is yeah. the book. Let's talk about your book. The book. Yeah. Last Acts of Kindness. Lessons for the Living from the Bedsides of the Dying. Wow, that's <laughs> a great subtitle, great so, title. Um, what are the lessons? <laughs> you know, I wrote this book, it was published in 2010, but I wrote it over many years. Mm -hmm. um, when I, I ran an intensive care unit in a hospital for a while, I worked in oncology as an oncology nurse, um, I had my own nonprofit up in Mendocino County. I've worked with people privately. And so this book is really stories of people who I have midwifed in the dying process over many years. Um, and it's in three sections. It's a section of people who I worked with in hospitals, people in some kind of residential facility, and people at home. And I did that purposely so that people could understand there, there are qualitative differences in how we die and where we die. Mm -hmm. And we actually have choices about that. And you know, oftentimes people don't realize they have choices. Partly in order to fulfill your wishes and choices, you have to be willing to think about the fact that you might die someday <laughs> right. and talk about it with your friends and loved ones. Uh, the best way to do that is, of course, by completing an advanced directive for healthcare, right. and then having conversations with the people who who love you and support you about, you know, if my first choice is to die at home in the place that I feel most comfortable, then you have to have certain things in place to do that. You know, a lot of people don't understand that 
Hospice is a medical team. It doesn't provide 24-7 care for you. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a lot of people say, oh, okay, finally I'm going to hospice, so somebody will be here to take care of me all the time. That's not true. Right. They're a medical team who will visit you several times a week, as often as needed when you're really ill, but most people who are seriously ill need other levels of care. And unfortunately, the way our healthcare system works, those levels of care are not paid for by insurance. So home care is a big industry and it's private pay. Right. Some long-term care insurance will cover home care, but there, you know, if you're on Medi-Cal, you have access to some subsidized home care. At Jewish Family and Children's Services, we have some subsidies for home care, but typically in order to stay at home, with someone taking care of you around the clock, it's very costly. Yeah. I mean, we're talking Thousands. $15,000, $20,000 a month if yeah. you need 24-7 care. So when people say, I absolutely want to stay at home at the end of my life, you have to have a pretty darn good support system in place in order for that to happen. You know, so often I see families where, you know, the 88-year-old, wife is dying and the 89 year old husband is trying to take care of her mm -hmm. and you know maybe there's an adult child from new york who flies <laughs> in right. and is trying to piece together a support system and it's very challenging you know which is why so in studies that have gone on for years you know in this country you know 80 percent of people say they prefer to die at home but really only about 40 or 45 percent get to still because it's hard. Yeah. It kind of takes a village, which is often why people end up in some kind of, you know, facility or still dying in the hospital. So we use euphemisms like transition, passing on to talk about death, and terms like that presuppose an afterlife. Is there <laughs> is there an afterlife? <laughs> I don't think I'm the one to ask whether there <laughs> is or isn't an afterlife. Somebody must know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are people who think they know. Um, everybody has a different idea yeah. about whether or not there is an afterlife, whether there's something to live for. Certainly every spiritual, spiritual tradition has their own ideas about it. You know, what I can say is that in my experience at the bedsides of hundreds, maybe thousands of people, I do think that people who have some kind of spiritual center or belief system have a little bit of an easier time with the challenges mm -hmm. that happen spiritually when someone's dying. Um, when my, sis my sister died at age 57, um, she'd had breast cancer for 11 years that had metastasized and she kept going and going and going. She was an amazing person. and. She never wanted to talk about death and dying. She just always wanted to keep living. She was a professor. She was always going to keep teaching. And about six months before she died, I was visiting her in Southern California, and my brother was there and her husband, and we were about to go for a walk on the beach. And she said, OK, before we go, I, I need to talk to you. And she sat us all down. And she said, you know, we didn't grow up with any kind of religion because we had a Jewish father and a Catholic mother and nobody <laughs> could decide what to do. Right. And I don't really understand what this spiritual stuff is that you talk about pointing to me. And she said, but without either one of those things, I think it's going to be hard to die and I need help. And that was such an opening for all of us, partly because she admitted that she needed help and she admitted that she did know that she wasn't going to live a whole lot longer. We didn't know exactly when. But I felt like it was a very true statement that without some kind of spiritual grounding, I've watched people have a harder time with the process. And whether they believe in an afterlife or just that, you know, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, there's something that, that they can surrender to. Well said. Um, the website for Seniors at Home? Seniorsathome.org or JFCS, 
jewishfamilychildrenservice.org. Yeah. Um, you can go to either one of those websites and you know click on events, click on information, and you can find us. You can find the different events that we're involved in, which there, there, there's always something happening. Red Wing K is our director of palliative care at our palliative care program at uh, Seniors at Home, at part of the JFCS. <laughs> <laughs> you got Thank it. Thank you so much for being here. I hope you come back sometime. You're so <laughs> welcome. I'm thrilled. Cheers. Cheers.